You're listening to The Higher Ed Marketer, a podcast geared towards marketing professionals in higher education. This show will tackle all sorts of questions related to student recruitment, donor relations, marketing trends, new technologies, and so much more. If you're looking for conversations centered around where the industry is going, this podcast is for you. Let's get into the show. Welcome to the Higher Ed Marketer Podcast. I'm Troy Singer, and as always, I'm here with my co-host and MIDI golf caddy, Bart Kaler, where each week we do our best to interview higher ed marketers that we admire for the benefit and hopefully the betterment of the entire higher ed marketing community. Bart, today we get to talk to Steve Brady, who is the Vice President of Institutional Advancement at the Rose Hulman Institute of Technology, and we are talking to him about the future of capital campaigns for small and mid-sized universities. Yeah, it's it's a great conversation, and and in all um, transparency, Steve is a client, former client of, of Kaler Solutions. We worked on the uh, two hundred fifty million dollar capital campaign with him, and uh, he'll talk a little bit more about that during the show. But I really like a lot of what Steve talks about, kind of the future of where you know where things are shifting, where instead of going you know two hundred fifty million dollars every ten years, there's you know, and and don't you know don't tune out right now because those are big numbers for your school, you know just take off a couple zeros and think about it from, you know, a $25 million campaign. But instead of doing that, you're kind of doing little mini chunks of that instead of waiting for 10 years, you're doing in, in three or four years. So I like his, uh, his philosophy on, on this. And, and I think that, you know, pay attention to it. There's a lot of really good nuggets in there for higher ed marketers. Uh, he's very articulate and very passionate about what he does. And I think it's a great episode. And very interesting to listen to and to speak with. And here is Steve Brady from Rolls Holman. Today, we get to talk to Steve Brady of Rolls Holman in Terre Haute, Indiana. And before we get into our conversation about capital campaigns, would love to hear from Steve a little bit about Rolls Holman and your role there. Thanks, Troy and, and Bart, for having me on. So I've been, I've been at Rolls Holman for uh, just going uh, on six years now, and I'm the vice president of institutional advancement. So my role encompasses naturally all things alumni relations and fundraising. And uh, Rose Holman, for those of you who don't know, is a small engineering-focused uh, STEM-only school that is primarily undergraduate in Terre Haute, Indiana. We are about 2,000, give or take, uh, undergraduate students focusing, like I said, only on engineering, math, and science majors. Uh, we've been around since 1874, started as Rose Polytechnic, and then in the early 70s, Transition into Rose Holman. We have been ranked by U.S. News and World Report as the number one undergraduate engineering under, uh, focused school for the last 23 years, something that we're, we're very proud of. And when you start to look at where our graduates end up, they do incredible things and they're uh, very, very successful, not only in the Midwest, but around the, the country and around the world. Thank you, Steve. The reason why we reached out to you to be a guest on the show is Bart was very familiar and I believe even worked with you Mm -hmm. around capital campaigns and the conversations went back and forth of the current state and how they're changing. And that's what we would like to tap back into today. So if you would, if you could touch a little bit about one of the campaigns that you recently finished and also, um, the current state of where capital campaigns are in your view. So Rose just wrapped up back in uh, end of June, early July, our mission-driven campaign. And this was a $250 million comprehensive campaign. So a comprehensive campaign, uh, by our definition, includes all things capital, but all things mm-hmm. also endowment and our continuing operational needs. And so we had a variety of um, important focuses of the campaign, a new academic building, a renovation to the union, some other just general sort of capital needs uh, around campus in addition to growing our uh, scholarships. Endowed scholarships is very important. And then uh, faculty support, endowed chairs, uh, new programs, et cetera. So that's kind of what we just wrapped up. It took us a while. We had uh, a fair amount of transition both at the presidential level but also in the vice presidential level. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Bart came in and was helpful from a marketing perspective, kind of uh, coming in, being handed a, um, a box of craziness and said, hey, could you put some of this <laughs> together in a cohesive order? And by the way, we needed it yesterday. <laughs> uh, and so we, we did some, I think, some good work, both from a marketing perspective as far as getting our 
uh, our online presence up and running. And um, then we'd use some of our internal communications to do some of our videos and uh, just general press releases to sort of keep the message out there. But it was a, a, a unique campaign in, in large part because it started and had what I would say starts and stops over the years. Mm. And now that we finished, one of the things I'm, I'm working towards, and it's still a little bit up in the air as to how it will work, if it will work, if I'll be allowed to do it, who knows? But the idea of focusing less on a comprehensive campaign and more on what we're sort of terming, a, a term using the term like mini campaigns. And mini campaigns probably being, uh, again, using our benchmark of $250 million for a comprehensive campaign. For us, a mini campaign might be anywhere between 20, 30, maybe $50 million for a very specific project that is uh, ideally going to motivate our alumni and donors to say this this project is really what the most important need is right now. And it's something that we want to focus on for uh, what I would consider is a relatively short amount of time. Uh, again, our comprehensive campaign lasted 10 years. Most campaigns are somewhere in the seven, eight years, give or take. Um, but it allows us to hopefully get in, do some interesting fundraising, fill a need that's uh, particularly pressing for the Institute at the time, and then start to move on to the next really important project for, for Rose Holman. That's great. And Steve, I know when we were talking earlier before the uh, before the recording, we were kind of talking about the campaign that we worked on together. But one of the things that I think you made a comment was is just how sometime even with with capital campaigns. And I know you and I, our careers span from, you know, before we had the Internet to do everything. Um, mm -hmm. Now we have the Internet. Sometimes it can be a, a, a blessing and sometimes it can be a curse. Tell us a little bit about what you're thinking on that. So the, the current number, or I mean, current being maybe within the last year or two of uh, 501c3s out there is somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.6 million. Mm -hmm. And most of those, I think, again, I'm, I'm trying to go off of memory and it's anecdotal, so don't, <laughs> don't quote me on it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's something like 90% or like a, a, a tremendous amount of these um, new or nonprofits, 90% of them are, uh, are new as of 1950. And so when you think about just about every nonprofit out there has been in existence relatively short amount of time compared to your traditional churches, many cultural organizations and higher education who've been around for hundreds of years, the internet, in my opinion, has really done a lot to sort of allow this micro philanthropy where people can get very specific with the causes that they want to impact. They can direct their dollars in a way that they couldn't pre-internet. If you are passionate about something as specific as uh, making sure that people in South Sudan, not just Sudan, but South Sudan, have access to clean water, you can find a charity, and they are working towards that. And you can give online, and you can make that happen. And that's something that uh, I would say pre-Internet you, you couldn't do. No. You couldn't blanket through mass, ma uh, mass marketing. You couldn't. Uh, most, most of these 501c3s nonprofits can't afford to do advertisements in a way to get to a general audience. But between the Internet and social media, there is an ability to get in front of people in a way that we just couldn't before. So it's great from a smaller nonprofit's perspective because it's lowered the sort of the cost of entry. But at the same time, it's increased competition because uh, previously, I would say most higher educations uh, were, were competing with the, you know, your Salvation Army and your churches for trying to get the front of mind messaging to our prospects. Now I'm competing with uh, 1.5999999 uh, other millions of nonprofits out there who have compelling cases. They have reasons to be supported. And my creativity has to be better than theirs in a way that engages and attracts prospects yeah. um, that I think pre-internet we didn't really have to deal with. Yeah, I think you're right on that. I think sometimes, too, it... it uh, it, it it's a danger of donor fatigue. You know, they're going to just be seeing so much of the same thing come across, but also the fact that I think that sometimes it's just um, really important as, as, uh, as like you said, the higher ed and, and, and some of the other folks, we really need to almost craft our messaging and, and the distinctiveness very clearly. And it forces us even more so in that realm, because I mean, you can use all kinds of tools to do the research, to find out who are going to be the donors and who has the, the capacity to give and those types of things. And I, I'm talking about the donors that not the, not the $500 type, you know, yearly gifts. I'm talking about moving into the major donors. They're getting accorded a lot more than, than they ever have been. Yeah, the uh, the amount of online research to find out who has capacity out there, 
is, uh, I mean, I remember when I first started uh, in higher ed fundraising, which was 25 plus years ago, you use zip codes primarily to gauge where people had wealth. And I remember I was working at my alma mater and they're very excited because they came to me and said, Steve, one of your classmates uh, lives in this zip code and we think he's worth millions of dollars. And I said, I, I know Jason, we went out for a beer a couple of weeks ago. He's, he's living in his uncle's garage. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have, uh, you know, and I had to buy his beer. So the, you know, the ability to really get down and find out through public, uh, publicly available information who has capacity and then reach out to them has uh, changed so much in the last 10 years that you're right, finding $500 donors is one thing, but trying to find those major gifts uh, at the $25,000, $50 million or more is getting more and more competitive. One of the things that we're trying to do at Rose Holman is, you know, you think about the, the old adage that it's easier and more cost effective to keep a customer than it is to find a new customer. That's the, the business saying. And we're, we're sort of trying to recognize that, particularly from a stewardship perspective. Our ask, you know, we're, we can be as creative as we want on the ask, but we're really competing with many other uh, organizations on the ask. But if we can get even a gift of obligation from an alum, can we steward that gift? Can we thank that donor more creatively and more personally that makes them a repeat donor? And so this, again, is sort of why we're, we keep leading ourselves back to these sort of micro or mini campaigns where if we are going to do something very specific for one area and we get a 1,000 donors to, to participate in it, can we focus on just stewarding with regular communication those 1,000 donors what's going on with the new building or what's going on with this new uh, program in a way that we hadn't historically done. Yeah, that's great. Because, I mean, I think you, you you walk that fine line. I used the word earlier, donor fatigue. You walk that fine line of how many times you're going back to talk to them and how many times are you asking them versus how many times are you thanking them, particip- getting them, inviting them to participate just because of who they are, not necessarily because and because of the relationship that you have with them. I mean, sometimes I think as 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 marketers and we, we sometimes forget that it's as much about the relationship building as it is about, you know, a specific specific ask. Yeah, I mean, you go to any fundraising conference that, across the country and they will, at least they used to always do this, everybody, you know, raise your hand, why do you think people give? And the number one answer is always because I was asked. And so you're absolutely right. I think there's a lot of donors out there who have supported projects that they may not be passionate about simply because they were asked and there was a relationship there. And then there's a whole other set of donors who are giving regardless of the relationship because of the passion of the project. Right. And, you know, you can talk about gifts of obligation and gifts of passion. You know, we got to figure out a way to, in my opinion, transition those gifts of obligation that we can get because of the relationship that we have existing through parents, community members, alumni, et cetera, and then find out what their passion is and then really try and leverage that to a, a larger gift. Okay. That sounds great. Steve, earlier you talked about transitioning from the longer, more uh, comprehensive campaigns to maybe, as you said, mini campaigns. would love to hear a little bit more about that. Could you kind of define that sure. a little bit more and give us a few examples of what you have in mind? Sure. So, you know, one of the things, uh, as I was stating earlier about the, the mission-driven campaign at Rose, and we had a lot of transition at the presidential level, you know, the, the average tenure of a college president is shrinking. And I think it's somewhere at six point six and a half years now, but I think even as recently as four or five years ago, it was closer to eight years. Presidents are transitioning quicker. And so if you think of your average silent phase being somewhere between three and four years, by the time the president has figured out what their priorities are, they're launching the maybe the silent phase, but then they're also transitioning on to the next school. And, you know, I've worked with a number of wonderful presidents through my career, and I've, I've seen a number of these wonderful presidents kind of come in and say, well, I certainly understand why so-and-so thought this was the priority, but now I'm kind of married to this and I need to finish this. And oftentimes it's been right after the launch of a campaign and we're, we're having to continue to finish that campaign. With a more mini campaign that is a shorter in duration, like I said, maybe just two years, I believe we can get in, accomplish a goal, and then kind of get out and then transition that donor to the, the next um, project. I'm also, you know, as Bart was talking about uh, our conversation about donor fatigue, I think as we look at our donors, we can look at them in a way and say, 
this donor or this group of donors are, are passionate about this project, maybe it's athletics, and this group of donors is passionate about this project, which might be scholarships. We don't need to necessarily wait until one mini campaign is over before we launch the next. I think we have an opportunity to layer these on. And then because the messages are slightly different, because the goals of the programs are different, I'm hopeful that the donor fatigue lessens and that instead of uh, philanthropists coming to us and sort of saying, okay, what do you need this money for? And doing it, uh, like I said, out of obligation, they're kind of waiting to see what's on the horizon. I think our donors are more, particularly our certain uh, set of donors, are more sophisticated now than they were 30, 40 years ago. And I've, I've had conversations, I'm sure many major uh, gift donor or, uh, major gift officers have had this conversation where the donor is asking, I understand you're not in a campaign right now, but when will you be? And will this gift count towards that campaign? And it's simply because they recognize there's, we're always about to go into a campaign and they don't want to give their $100,000 gift now and then be asked two years from now when the campaign starts, sorry that other 100000 didn't count. We're looking for your next uh, right. gift to be counted on our new campaign. Yeah. And so uh, shorter durations, more focus, and then a, a more evolving cycle that I, I think could allow us the opportunity to keep donors engaged in the way that we have it before. I think even today too, Steve, just thinking about that, I mean, what we did a few years ago with the, with the Rose Driven, you know, we, it's a comprehensive campaign. We're presenting the case statement that has a lot of different things in it. With these mini campaigns, I would even think now, and especially with the way digital technology has kind of evolved and, and grown, you could probably do a lot more, you know, custom personalized case statements to particular donors that are excited because, I mean, you know, a very personalized case statement that says, here's, you know, we recognize who you are. We recognize mm -hmm. your passions. You can, you know, all the communications can be. And, and, and just being able to set up systems like that, uh, it seems like that's an opportunity, too, with these mini campaigns. Yeah, I think you know, I would say that the term "mini campaign" is not new. Right. Um, I don't think I don't think we're looking at doing anything that's overly unique. I think we're looking at it as an alternative to the comprehensive campaign. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the comprehensive campaign, you look at the annual fund, and you're as you're writing those annual fund materials. Oftentimes, I found when when I did it, I was trying to throw in as many little hot button items for everyone to get excited about. Mm -hmm. So I might touch on an athlete story just because I know some people are passionate about athletics. I might also touch about a faculty doing some interesting research because that's something else. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to get all these people at a very uh, consistent level to get excited about one fund. And that, that, in my mind, is a little bit what the comprehensive campaign is. I think you're absolutely right about the opportunity with a, a mini-year campaign to get really focused on what the donor's interested in and then really what hopefully groups of donors are interested right. in. So you know, I think Troy had asked what some of the possible mini-campaigns that we're looking at. Um, one of them is certainly going to be we're going to need to do something for our athletics uh, at Rose Holman sometime in the near future. We just got a, a new wonderful athletic director letting her get her um, feet on the ground and figure out what her uh, areas of opportunity are. I think it's going to be great. But uh, scholarships are continuing need. We just launched recently a couple of years ago this Novel Scholars Program, which is a, a, a very boutique scholarship program for special students who just do tremendous things. But growing out our scholarship opportunity is something we're always going to need to be focused on. We have a really growing area of entrepreneurism. And Rose has uh, the Sawmill Society, which is a group of alumni who are entrepreneurial and sort of support each other through online um, group chats to sort of say, do you need access to a patent attorney or are you looking to do some fundraising and how can we do that? And they're supporting each other. So we see that as another opportunity. So we're looking both at, you know, even the idea of we might do a capital campaign that would be a small campaign, but maybe layer on some programmatic elements that would be instead of a $15 million capital campaign might be a $20 million themed mini campaign right. around entrepreneurism or something like that. That's really cool. I like that. But I have to also wonder, and I'm ask you about this because I know a lot of schools are struggling. I mean, the the demographic cliff is coming up for undergraduate students. There's a lot of enrollment challenges going on. Com competition is getting stronger. So not only are you in the middle of doing fundraising for, for these, you know, comprehensive campaigns, these thematic, these, uh, you know, these capital campaigns, but you've also got this operational fundraising kind of going on in the background and probably getting more pressure on that. As you said, on the cabinet, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, so smaller schools, um, 
and I should say every school I've ever worked at, uh, has had a focus on its operational need, whether it's unrestricted dollars or uh, determined or called operations. Every school needs to keep the lights on. Everybody wants to keep uh, faculty and staff paid. That's pretty important. And, you know, Rose, like many, many schools, uh, is a tuition-driven institution. So you know, when, when we saw looking at the comprehensive campaign, if, if anybody asked me what's the most pressing need, it was always operations. Right. But that oftentimes is not the, the most attractive opportunity to get particularly large gifts, right? You, you, you don't see the needle move often buy a gift to the the fund for Rose Holman or the president's fund. It's it's kind of that uh, it's important and we're, we can't stop doing it. But that's really what the annual fund is for. Finding donors who want to be a part of that's a challenge. At the other end of the equation for, for Rose, many of our endowment gifts, particularly our larger ones, were coming in through both planned gifts and estate commitments uh, and, and a lot of uh, planned estate commitments. And so you have all these deferred gifts that are counting towards our comprehensive campaign goal. But at the end of the day, the number of times I would tell uh, faculty, alumni, and friends, I know that <laughs> I said we accomplished $250 million, and we did. I have the, I have the receipts to show for it, but there's not a, a pool on campus that's just filled with, with $250 million cash. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, uh, there's a good chunk of this that's going to come in in the next 10, 20 years, and that's important to track. But when you get down to the needs of the institution – and the needs of the campaign elevating, you, you, you really need those very project and dollar-specific goals to be front and center, in my opinion. Yeah. At the end of the day, you can't, I shouldn't say you can't, I've never been able to build a building on an estate commitment. Right. And especially something that's going to be multiple uh, decades out. And so looking a little bit closer to home, I think, is a, is a good opportunity. And I think that that gets back to how marketing and communications can help with that in the sense that, you know, sometimes it's even internal communications. You know, I've been, I've seen that before where big campaign completes, big things happen, but really can't quite deliver on some of the capital campaign promises because, you know, deferred giving. The money's not there. If the money's yeah. not there. And it's hard to understand, well, didn't we just raise this big money? Didn't we just do that? And I think that's where, you know, marketing and communications can come in, help craft those messages, help assure everyone of, of the success of everything. But um, yeah, it's I think that the the average person on campus and even out in public the alumni don't always understand the nuances of how fundraising works. Exactly. It's a it's an education. that I think you're right. has to happen. And it's something that we've been focusing on educating our donors as best we can, even to the cycle of how does awarding a scholarship work? Mm -hmm. How does that prospective student get their financial aid and where does their scholarship fit in? Because this is something that, you know, in my experience, we, we start endowing scholar, uh, scholarship gifts at $50,000. $50,000 only spends off 2000 and change right. each year. And a average tuition check, $2,000 isn't making or breaking that student's decision to attend Rose Holman. Right. I also recognize that for many people, writing a check of $50,000 is probably the largest first gift that many of them will ever make. For some people, it'll be made over a number of years, et cetera. So it's, it, it, $50,000 is still a large sum of money. But understanding how their scholarship is going to be a part of a package of other scholarships to allow these students to attend Rose Holman or whatever school they're going to be at is really important, I think, to the donors because it sets them up for success right. in a way that when... Uh, we're not educating our donors. We risk their uh, their stewardship being sort of off kilter simply because they're frustrated that something didn't work out. Yeah, right. and I think that I think not only is it important to make sure that the communications, the marketing to the donors is online, but I was working with a school last week about the importance of making sure that that financial aid award letter is also communicating those types of things to say, look, there's people behind this. There are alumni, people who are passionate about this place. They've actually sacrificed so that you can do this. And sometimes I think those kind of personalization and, and and leveraging those messaging and crafting that rather than just a typed up letter that says, Hey, here's your, here's your award, take it or leave it. Right. When you start putting in emotion, start putting in what we typically think of marketing might be, you know, in advertising or on the website, recognizing that every piece of communications that we have either with prospective students or with donors is an opportunity to strengthen that relationship. I think that's, that's a key point for some higher ed marketers. 
Steve, we wrap up every episode by asking our guests to share either a quick takeaway or maybe an idea that's top of mind that other advancement officers could possibly benefit from immediately. As I ask you that question, is there anything that you would like to share? So, you know, one of the things that's really top of mind right now for me is as everyone has been dealing with the, the pandemic and fundraising in the pandemic has been unusual and, and not anything that we could ever obviously plan for, but recognizing that uh, at least, you know, many of my gift officers are working some combination of remotely, but they're also separated by and large from traveling to meet with their prospects face to face. And as I talk to my gift officers, I guess my encouragement is to spend a little bit of extra time listening to your gift officers and people who are working with your prospects and donors to hear how they're doing. Many of us, myself included, going for long periods of time without sitting across the table and hearing stories about their time at their alma mater or why they give, that process energizes me. And that's where I drive, uh, derive my joy from my position is having those stories and those opportunities to engage with people. Not that these Zoom calls aren't great, but they're not, they're not the same. And I think we're going we're gonna to see a lot of people who are having a different type of fundraising burnout because I'm, I'm concerned that some of our gift officers for fundraising are losing some of the, the zeal that they had for their mission. And I think that's, it's important to, to do that. And then the, the other thing, and I think most, most people know this in, intuitively, but it's one of those moments that I try and remind myself all the time of never skip a small opportunity to thank a donor. And one of the things I found was even um, taking a picture with my cell phone and sending a text message of, hey, I just saw the, the artwork that you did in our new academic building as I drove in. Thanks again. That was awesome. It's really great. Those little things that are out of nowhere, I think, can mean more than the, uh, the recognition events that we often do, the large gifts we sometimes give donors, the, the portraits that we paint. I think the, the genuine unexpected thank you goes a lot further sometimes in uh, alleviating some donor fatigue and inspiring them in a way that we can't always comprehend. That's great. That's great, Stephen. Thank you very much for being such a engaging guest. If some of our listeners would like to reach out to you for further communication, how would they do that? So you can certainly find me online in LinkedIn. My name is Steve Brady. Uh, you can also find me on Rose Holman's, uh, which is rose-holman.edu and just do a search for Steve Brady. I'm the vice president of institutional advancement. I think I'm pretty easy to find. Your biggest competition in finding me is the uh, sex in the city guy. Uh, who's also apparently named Steve Brady. So, um, but uh, if uh, you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, continue these conversations. Uh, like I said, I've been in higher ed fundraising my entire career. Uh, it's something I'm passionate about, and uh, I'm fortunate that I get to work on a campus that I see the benefits of people's philanthropy every day uh, and the students and the buildings that they've been able to support. Thank you for allowing us to tap into that expertise. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Thanks, Bart. Thank you. Bart, do you have any final comments that you would like to make? Yeah, I just want to point out a couple of the the uh, things that Steve kind of said, just to kind of um, underscore it a little bit. But I think that you know, as we as higher ed marketers look at this, understanding that you know we're going to be called on to probably do more of these mini campaign types of I- I- ideas. I mean, your your institution might start looking at that and start saying, "Hey, we need to do that." Think about ways that you can actually utilize different methods to kind of build those mini campaigns and make them very distinctive and make even the donors, uh, you know, you might say, well, it's not quite as big as the last one. Treat each of them very individually and make sure that you're doing your best work on those things. And I think that will go a long way to give the, uh, the gift officers and the advancement department what they need to be able to really be successful in every, every aspect of what they do and never forget about storytelling. I mean, you know, Steve kind of indicated that and just being able to sit across and listen to that. Document those stories. Make sure you've got some organization that you can kind of reference from those because those are gold and you can really use those in all kinds of different ways, whether it's on the website, whether it's in donor communications, whether it's in your alumni magazine, just make sure you've got kind of a process in place for that. And then finally, just just think about ideas 
as a marketer, I think that you could help your, your advancement team. What are those little ways that you can say thank you? I mean, Steve kind of talked about the, the idea of a text message and a, and a quick things like that. Maybe you just kind of come up in your marketing team with, you know, sit around with your team and come up with five or 10 ideas, take them to the advanced department and say, Hey, here's some thoughts we had on just little ways that you might be able to thank your donors that are not the big events that we typically do. But, you know, you could use Steve's example of the, take a picture and send a text. Maybe there's a small thank you card that you, you know, print up some cards that you might want to have them just do personal notes with. Maybe you do personalized videos, kind of like when we talked to Ethan, um, Ethan Butte from Bomb Bomb Video. There's all kinds of ways to do it. You as marketers can kind of help facilitate some of that. And I, I kind of lean into that for you. So Bart, thank you very much. And to everyone that brings us to the end of another episode, the Higher Ed Marketer Podcast is sponsored by Kaler Solutions, an education, marketing, and branding agency. And by Think Matented, a marketing execution company customizing and personalizing print, mail, and digital marketing. On behalf of Bart Kaler, I'm Troy Singer. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to The Higher Ed Marketer. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you're listening with Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to leave a quick rating of the show. Simply tap the number of stars you think the podcast deserves. Until next time.